came to this topic, and basically it's sort of, it, it's what's left in self-assessment, and the point came to me is that I was sort of starting to think about all the, the up-ramping and auditing, and I, I you know, the, the the voodoo magic of the budget where you throw $500 million at the tax office and somehow it magically generates another $2 billion worth of money. And I thought, well, look, to what extent is these audit requirements and these things impacting on what we understood was one of the fundamental benefits of self-assessment, be it reduction in the amount of detail and stuff that you needed to lodge? And if we're going back to having to lodge absolutely everything, then shouldn't we get the trade-off again of having some degree of finality on what happens when we lodge it? So just picking up on those sort of points. And then as I sort of worked through the process a bit further, I thought, well, look, there are some things that are part of these strategies, as much as I might float that as a sort of more of an academic question, there are some things within the ATO's audit strategy that are being trialled at the big end and as we know, everything that's trialled at the big end, some of that floats down to us in sort of closer to the coalface in uh, small medium practice in terms of uh, client base of SME. And also looking at some of the things currently targeted at sort of essentially cash-based industries and seeing where are the weaknesses in those and trying to elicit from you guys some positive strategies on how you are handling these particular changes. Now, if we can slot that all in the remaining time, then we're doing well. So, sort of, that's essentially where my three points to do some sort of stock take, explore the, the ATO risk differential framework and uh, reportable tax positions, and then go on to look at sort of some of the, those, those small business strategies. What is self-assessment? Well, we remember what it used to be, or some of us do, um, where tax returns were lodged, and if you worked in the tax office in a seven hour, 21 minute day, you were expected to assess some thousand of those. If you worked in the Adelaide office, if you worked in the Hobart office, about somewhere about 230 to 300, but you had to do your own inquiry work in, in Hobart, so you had to actually send out the letters and act on the responses at a later date. So that was all built into your standard work. So the result is if you put that, and I think you know they ended up talking about business returns having about four minutes worth of scrutiny. So given that, um, and given that there was a finality when these things were lodged, so if you lodged them and made a true full disclosure and someone looked at it for four minutes and ticked the box, then your client was safe from subsequent audit. Self-assessment came along and then we had this major shift. Now. What happens was that is you lodge the return as you did before, but now the onus was on your client, or your client lodged it. Major change, um, major change even in terms of the world. The the Japanese claim they they've had self-assessment since the late nineteen early, late nineteen forties, but their version of self-assessment is you yes the onus is on you, but you lodge your return, but you lodge it with all the records. And they had major issues when they were talking about electronic lodgement because what they said is you lodge the return with um, electronically and then you send in the envelope with all the receipts. <laughs> so it's sort of a bit bizarre. But, and, but their, their greatest advantage is because the onus is on the taxpayer, they actually hand out money to people in private practice to prepare tax returns for their clients. Now, there's an innovation some of us would like to see come forward. <laughs> okay. What were the major benefits? Well, at the time when they introduced the legislation, there really wasn't much said about it other than um, sort of speeches from various uh, ministers like Chris Herford who sort of talked about the savings to the tax office. And suddenly in 1990, we had some comments around, well, you know, this is about saving a fair amount of money. So 89, 90, they thought that they'd save about $80 million in processing costs internally within the ATO. And the advantages that were sold to us, the bits that I've sort of put in bold up there on the board, that we were going to need less information. And there was going to create opportunities for smooth workflows for tax agents. <laughs> Little did they know. <laughs> and 
you know, moving through this stuff sort of relatively quickly. We, we, we started with this basic system where effectively come 1 July 1986, suddenly everyone became responsible for their own returns and that's all that about happened. Not much else happened. Then over time, we went to a full self-assessment for companies and superannuation funds where they were expected to lodge and pay virtually at the same time. And all the assessment was finalised at the point of lodgement automatically. And by about sort of the, the, the sort of 1990s, there was sort of some concern that one of the problems of shifting everything to the taxpayer was the taxpayer was meant to know everything. So before, the responsibility was on the tax office to apply the law, had you made a true and full disclosure, tick the box and issue you with your assessment. Post-1986, what, what the government effectively was saying was, you as an individual understand all the tax law, understand your obligations, you lodge your tax return and you can be visited and from a starting point, if you make a mistake, you're liable for the shortfall, you're liable for penalties, interest charge and the like. So it's a big change. Yes, ultimately as an individual taxpayer prior to 1986, I had to lodge a tax return. I was still responsible for making sure that what I included in there was correct. But had I made a true and full disclosure of my material facts, then I was safe. Someone wasn't coming back two years later or four years later or some, some, under, some unlimited amendment period somewhere much further back. So to try and get over this, sort of try and reverse the balance slightly, we ended up with binding rulings, which are now obviously atoids and that myriad of work that comes out of the tax office, some of it binding, some of it not. We had changes to the amendment processes, changes to periods and so on. This process continues. You get report um, 326 that sort of says you need to address this a, a little bit more uh, actively. You need to get the balance there. We had the mass market of schemes through the late 90s where <coughs> effectively most of the general public had forgotten that what they put on a tax return didn't matter and the fact they relied on somebody at, so you're working in a coal mine, you know, in a, in a mine in, out in the desert and a salesman turns up and sells you a wonderful product and says, gee, you know, you can save a lot of tax, just give me 50 grand and you'll get $150,000 tax deduction. No one thought that there was anything wrong with that. That was just, that's the way the system must have worked. Might have had a barrister's opinion or part of a barrister's opinion attached. Um, Usually it was a part that the barrister didn't know was going to be attached, but it was attached there. Um, and we had this massive problem where people on that sort of high earning for a short period of time put a lot of money into these things and for many of them to fall over. Some, in fact, uh, despite having the uh, non-recourse loans, actually were in the end very, very valuable. There was one on whiskey's futures where they effectively went and bought one year's worth of Scotland's uh, whiskey supply. Um, and over time, well, they didn't buy the whole lot, but over time, because of the blending process, you actually use it all up. So all that, that, that scheme got turned over by the commissioner and there are sort of prosecutions in vain for the people who organised it. Those whisky futures are worth an absolute fortune now because all the whisky's been used up, there's one year gap, and that, that happens to be held by the investors in this particular project. And one of the biggest winery projects out at near Orange, um, which is climbing ladder, climbing bridge, um, that's going gangbusters. It arose out of those schemes. We have Rosa in 2004, again pushed to, um, it, it arose out of sort of basically the, the ants and the review of business tax, which sort of threw in a few bits and pieces. And we got a number of changes. I suppose the only thing that sort of really drag back is that when you get to Rosa in 2004, Treasury just doesn't get the fact that this change to taxpayers has a big influence. They go, under both systems, the tax office issues notices of assessment, but can review later and impose interest penalties. 
Nevertheless, many taxpayers considered that the move to self-assessment was an important change because finality disappeared. Funny about that. The difference has been a matter of great significance for some. I would have thought it was for all taxpayers. So we've gone through this process and, and there are a whole range of slides that I, I've, I've sort of run through the history and if you're a history nut you can sort of find the little footnotes down the bottom and find out which minister announced which, when, to whom. So we've moved through this system where we, we, not only have we seen it extend operate, so we've got now sort of binding rulings, we've got a lot of areas of support and protection um, in the mid-2005, we had a number of major changes in terms of um, changes to the penalty system, um, recognising the fact that if you, for example, had made a mistake that you weren't actually withholding all the money from the tax office and there should be a different interest charge chosen at that point of time to one where you don't actually pay the bill on time. Um, shortened periods, which has some advantages, although at the time uh, we were concerned that it was greater to have a shorter period for, from the taxpayer's viewpoint in the tax office coming after you, but often you would make mistakes or miss things and that, that didn't necessarily mean that they should have operated from the taxpayer side, but Treasury wanted symmetry. Through to 2007, we've got continuing reviews, and as the power point out, is Treasury's reviews are all based upon this assumption of there's some symmetry between the tax office and and um, taxpayers, they've got equal powers, equal resources, and this comes through all of these documents, which we all know does not reflect the reality, doesn't reflect the reality in your practices in terms of your dealings with the tax office, and as time's gone on and money's got tighter, we're finding a more aggressive, less flexible tax office in terms of administration. And we've seen it go through. Also, more recently, um, the amendment periods continue to be adjusted. Um, we've, we've also had an extension of the current self-assessment system across a range of different taxes, um, particularly to GST and WET. Um, and more recently, um, the ruling systems have been, between GST and income tax have been matched number of reviews and finally um, in April legislation was passed to apply for once, 1 July that basically harmonises the tax in terms of GST, luxury car, wine equalisation and fuel tax, probably the only other area that needs some work is getting FBT more modernised but basically four year periods of review, um, the ability to correct Bazes, um, at the com when the Commission declares you can do that. So there's a number of good changes out of that. Um, out of these processes, we've also got the Inspector General doing a number of re reviews looking on the balances of cost. So this is probably the first review that started to look at, well, to what extent are the risks and the balance shared? That's all I really wanted to say about the history of self-assessment. We still are in a situation that we're better than we were in 1986. The system isn't balanced. There's still this concern with most taxpayers that if they, well, they don't appreciate that there's a concern. They come and see you guys and you lodge the return and if somehow they get a query, it's somehow your problem, not theirs. And it's that lack of finality that lack of security that's a problem. Advantages for small, most small business and, and individuals, we've got a, a two-year period, um, four years for most others, except in, in, in limited circumstances, so there's some positives there. That said, is it a situation of balance? Probably not, uh, but at least it's far better than where we were 30 odd years ago. Now I'm going to sound like I work for the tax office. <laughs> we have three compliance pillars of compliance and you would have 
seen this in the stuff that the, the focus of how they now audit is, they're talking about the what drives their audit program is one about getting people registered. Once you've got someone registered, so that's why you go into the schools and sign up all the school kids to give them tax file numbers. The minute you've got someone registered, you've got them, you know who they are and you've got some basis of trying to call on them. The next thing is you can't work out their tax if they don't give you anything. So you've got to try and get them to lodge. So we see the focus on the lodgement program. Um, it's been quite generous. Now we're starting to see a clawback. We're starting to see um, certain classifications re being reapplied to tax agents. If you haven't lodged 85% of your returns by a particular date, you're not a very good tax agent and certain things will flow from that as a, as, as, which sort of fails the responsibility, the recognition of what you're dealing with when your clients come in, how responsive they are to processes. And, all, and this change has happened very dramatically. It's essentially driven by a government imposing on the tax office, get the money in. So now you're seeing, I've heard stories even while I'm here of people about to get a return, you know, about to catch up on a client suddenly receiving three default notices with penalties for days late um, and with no point of remission ever being there. So they haven't actually got the returns in, they're already starting to receive the $550 penalties plus interest. So it, it is something that will create further pressure back into your practices in terms of and we're moving back to the days when I remember sitting at the Lodgement Working Party um, in the um, early 2000s where you were negotiating around you know, how much you'd lodged by December and then that gave you a certain extension rate through. There's sort of a bit of a return back to that. We haven't quite got anywhere near there. But all of that fails to recognise that we're actually in a system where we're virtually running 365 days a year of lodgement. That's the only way we get the information in. The, the tax office has a major asset in terms of, and they realise this with the GST, initially they opposed um, tax agents being the major source of GST form filling and everything was sent out to everyone's individual homes and pieces of paper arrived like that in people's offices. That was all driven by this belief that you know, it was somehow the tax agent causing the problem. The reality is when 71% of individuals use you, 95% of businesses use you, it gives the tax office a very limited area where they can get all the information from. It gives them a whole series of very cheap ways of conveying information and making the collection. So the reality is they need you probably a little bit more than you need them. And when they ever get these clawbacks, we start getting these tensions where we start saying, well, you actually don't recognise what we need. And finally, payment, which we're again seeing the crank up in terms of chasing debts. And we all know, even in our own practices, that if we don't chase debts quickly, then we, our chances for each month we leave it, our chances of actually making a collection from that client start plummeting. Tax office, yes, we can understand why they're doing that, and but, you know, there are sometimes hard cases that you have as clients that just need a bit more time. Compliance model. You've seen it. I was told in a discussion with, a lot, even though this is, and what we're going to move on to is, the client's model in its, its sense is, if they deem you to have not decided not to comply, then we will use the full sense of the law. So it's about where we put our penalties and our positions. At the large business end, they're starting to use something called a risk differ differentiation framework. Now, it's having and sort of built into this sort of discussion was, well, how do we care? We don't necessarily have big clients. Do we care about what they're doing here? And essentially, what you know, the tax office argues that the compliance model reflects different taxpayer attitudes to compliance and corresponding enforcement actions where this thing assesses the risk and determines the intensity of the ATO response. And at the large business area, it means that if you fall into a category, then you can be under continuous review. 
And from that continuous review, we then work out what we're going to do to you. And when you start looking at the category, so essentially it determines the intensity of the response. It's based upon the premise that the ATO's management stance on risk will, will vary depending upon how they perceive you. And they perceive you by saying, what is your likelihood of non-compliance? But what they mean by that is a tax outcome that the ATO does not agree with. And we start seeing this in a number of areas. They take a view that you, your client should have a particular tax outcome, and if you're not meeting that, you then like that's your likelihood of focus. They look at the consequences, dollars, relativities, reputation, precedent. Based upon that, they put taxpayers into four broad categories. High risk, medium risk, um, key taxpayers, and then lower risk. And obviously the area they focus is going to be at that upper end, but they do it for each individual tax. So it's not looking at a taxpayer in the sense of have they lodged their income tax returns and therefore very good. It's how are they doing with their BASs, how compliant are they in their, their BASs, um, and so on. They do a two, twice year risk profile and the sort of risk filters are, they look at the past behaviour of your client, um, their tax risk management governance, uh, business performance compared with tax outcomes. So if there's a difference at the sort of medium end where you've got a client who also has some published records, the extent to which the accounting doesn't match up to the tax. Uh, significant transactions that allow opportunities for planning, so for building a business is expanding various industry segments and so on. The problem is you can start seeing this process starting to filter in, whether it's starting with the lodgement side, classifying agents along these lines, and this sort of debate went on for about the last 10 years about should we give gold star agents and special services, and therefore anyone else who's not a gold star agent gets second rate services and great focus. This sort of stuff that is what Tony's been having to deal with over the last 10 years on, on behalf of the IPA and a number of other organisations have been trying to convince the tax officers it's not the way to go. And in fact, in countries like Sweden and, and in Europe generally, you cannot offer different levels of service to taxpayers. It's that simple. It's constitutionally not viable. We don't have those constitutional protections in Australia, so we get this, this process of how do we, you know, the, these risk profiles. The other thing I just wanted to touch on very briefly is there is now also for large business what they call um, reportable tax positions. And essentially this is when you advise a client and you go, okay, look, it's not certain, we don't, it doesn't fall outside, it falls slightly outside a ruling, but you know, it might be travel to and from work and home. What the end result is what happens is under this model which they, they, they put taxpayers at the big end through is they, they're saying to them what you need to do is you need to tell us the percentage of your uncertainty. So you need to disclose in your tax return that you have given a particular, you've taken a particular tax position and not that it's reasonably arguable and therefore defendable under the current tax law, you've got to put a percentage on it. We believe that we have taken a right, the right position and we believe that it's 70% correct. Now, tax officers only got to get this information. They don't have to do anything with it. So they don't have to come back to you and adjust and you know, deal with it when you lodge it with the return. They come back towards the end of the two year period, say, we disagree with you. By the way, there's some shortfall penalty here, some general interest charge because you haven't paid on time and so on. Now we're seeing it at the large end, yes, it, it, it's, it's very focused, um, it's, it's, it's based upon US models, the tax office argues there's a whole range of reasons of why they're doing it, but it doesn't take a huge stretch of the imagination to say, well, what if I have some clients at the sort of larger medium size or the small growing to the medium size? It doesn't take very long for the tax office to say, okay, we've done with the 500 big business companies, let's take this at a lower level and let's start asking other taxpayers to lodge this sort of information.
So all, all, a lot of this stuff is, is broadly spelled out. So there's sort of some of the things that I fear for the future. Reportable payments, you're aware they start. The only issue that I, I've perceived there, which is a major, can be of some concern, is going to be your software. Given that this is what the tax office expects you, and it, it's interesting, it's up on the website now, even though the regulations declaring all of this are yet to be, as they use the word, made. So they haven't actually been long enough in Parliament to be made, but the tax office has already got this stuff off telling you that you've got to do this by a particular date. The big problem is you will have contractors' names or your client's software will have a name of a contractor, may have the name of their ABNs, may have their addresses. They will tell the amount paid, but a lot of the software programs then strip the GST out. So it goes off. It doesn't stick to that individual payment. It's, the, it washes out whether it's an expense you incur or it's GST you collect, that all gets stripped out into a central account. So when you try and backload your records, you know you, they've paid GST, but it's not something that's stored. It's not something that comes out as a record. Now, it may depend on software by software, but certainly a number of practitioners I'm talking to, that's their major area of concern. And given, hopefully, it will change over the year, the problem is if the MyOBS and those don't do it quick enough, What's going to happen is you're going to have, a, a, have to put patches in to re-extract information halfway during the year because once you get to the end of next financial year, you will have 21 days to submit this information on behalf of your clients. Benchmarks. Hands up who's had a client that has been at the bottom of a benchmark audit. One honest person up the back, oh good, okay. So you know that they've been there. They've been around since about 2006. Um, certainly at things like the Business and Construction Industry Forum, they started to develop these things in the sort of late November 2007, 2008. The first couple were done with a great deal of rigour and science. They basically went out to the industry associations. They said, how many bricks does he, do you expect your average bricklayer to lay? They actually went into great details and they combined that information from the organisations with the tax return data. Between about 2008 and 2010, when they started using these things in a very different way to what they promised, essentially they just went back to historic data. So whatever under your industry code and where you fit, that becomes a particular outcome, then that figure will be applied in this year that we're looking at now, regardless of where you sit. So it doesn't matter that it, the data we're using is a year old and there wasn't a GFC when it was there, we're now looking at it and there is a GFC, we're just still going to apply the same data. And if you fall outside the details that were the average in the previous year, then you will end up having a call. The middle line was there was a speech given by the Assistant Commissioner, then Assistant GST, to the ATPF meeting in November 2008. And he said, it is not intended to be used for default assessments or audits. I don't, and suddenly you get, you know, the Inspector General saying, oh, by the way, uh, They've been using it since 2010. You go, well, where did we go from November 2008 to 2010? And what was worse, we went from six or eight of these things to 104 of them. That's why I filled out so many slides. I decided to tell you which ones were there. Now, there's a couple of ones I like. The tattooing services, I think, is actually a wonderful topic to see how accurate that actually is. Watch and jewellery retailing is one that I know uh, mates had some issues with. So look, and now we've got an Inspector General review, Inspector General talking about these things. Now what will come out of that? Well, who knows? Let's look at tattooing services. <laughs> now, 50k to 100,000 expenses, average total expenses 48%. Inspectors to go out and, and challenge the 
Well, look, I don't know. I, I, I just downloaded these things and it sort of came, because, you know, in New South Wales, we've got Barry O'Farrell who's sort of trying to ban their colours and saying, you know, gangs can't use tattoo shops and I know the local Comancheros are a bit upset down our street, down the, at our local shopping centre because they're, they're tattoo ta parlours. Now, you'll find on my paper I refer to the fact that, and it was this whole thing, I started looking through these benchmarks and I want, thought, does this include the illicit drugs or not? <laughs> because the cost base should actually be a bit greater than this. And then I started thinking, well, look, labour turnover, drive-bys. <laughs> You're surely going to have higher industry costs in some of these things. And, you know, yeah, well, they're all part of the gang. <laughs> but Yeah, that's right, yeah. But they're very expensive bikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they can drop them occasionally and they make lots of... And so... And there were, just as I was coming, on the 20th of May in the Sydney Morning Herald, they ran, a, and I've put the extract in the bottom one of the footnotes, it is this article, John Ibrahim's Bazooka Proof Tattoo Parlour. <laughs> and it's got this photo of this man there and he says, look, uh, legitimate businesses need a, business, a bazooka proofed wire mesh and bulletproof windows. But a certain gentleman who wants to revolutionise the uh, tattoo industry in King's Cross so he's basically building an emporium that he wants to have over a million dollars turnover a year. So he obviously is going to fall out of these benchmarks. They're going to have to do something to deal with him. <laughs> he's got sort of... His view is that, you know, I'm not worried about rustling a few feathers, but I'm not naive or stupid. I have systems and countermeasures in place like Israeli bazooka-proof meshing covering the whole building. Now, that surely impacts on some of these total expenses then you're setting this up. <laughs> We're working on historic figures. So, of course, if you didn't have the bazooka mesh on the previous year and you've got it in this year, then, of course, your cost of goods sold are going to vary. And, of course, you're going to have an issue about visits from the tax office. <laughs> so that's just, you know, paying light-hearted, but it raises the problem of these benchmarks by taking it seriously and saying, and how do you handle it? And I know we're tight on time, but I did want to actually start exploring, <laughs> sort of as we tell in this, about what are the strategies for handling this? Do your staff know or do you know that there's 104 of these things? To what extent do you take preemptive action? So is, do you print it out as part and parcel of when you, you know, you, you do the, 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 the information in? Do you have the resources to do that given the client profile and, the, and your, your charge out rates per client. That's the sort of things that come into how much of this information. When you get an audit, what defences can you do? Because the problem we know with the tax office is these things sit there. Even if you, you have a whole series of explanations of why your client has exceeded these, you have to wait till the audit comes. There is no way of preempting ATO activity and going in and saying, yes, happy if you want to do a, a, a record keeping review, but these are the reasons why my client varies. There is no feedback or no place that you can defend your position. It's the same issue with GST reviews. Your client buys a brand new bulldozer, totally outside of what they normally do, large GST refund, and you know it's going to be stopped and there's nothing you can do about it other than warn the client that they've got some cash flow issues to follow. These are the things where the tax office should be looking at improving. It should be allowing you as an active member looking after your clients can anticipate their audit action and deal with it early so that you're not having to play catch up, getting audits at the wrong time when it doesn't fit your workflow and and, and creating distress and whatever else happens for a client who has essentially done nothing wrong. So they're one of the issues. The other big, big problem is the industry codes. I've got... There's a client of a, a friend who is a costume jewellery retailer. You don't even have an industry code because she's into costume jewellery, she sells bits of clothing and whatever else. She doesn't fit into any of these categories. And then what happens is the commissioner put, makes you put them into all these different numbers, and they are all different numbers, then says, oh, by the way, we've got one, ben we've got one benchmark. 
they're all very different. And you're going to say that they all fall under the same category? So those posh jewellers down in Double Bay in Sydney with the, the blocked up doors and security guards sitting out the front is going to be the same as the little watchmaker at the bottom of a railway station or opposite a bus terminus? And I think this is the growing biggest problem you're going to have in practice because it's just going to get worse. The more they squeeze, the more you're going to get a closing between what is a proper turnover and where more additional work needs to be done. And that's probably an area where this stuff has exploded, but there needs to be some pushback. There needs to be, and, and it's reasonable to say, the tax officer says, well, we've got this big machine and you pu put everything in and there's no way we can stop the stuff being pumped out at the end. And that's rubbish. If they want to stop something, because they think there's a big refund involved, they stop it. They happily pull it out. They're happy to sit on it for a long period of time. So there are, and it, you know, I don't sort of mean to be negative, you know, in the conference on a really sad note. <laughs> you know, like if we really want to be sad, think of the poor old bikies with the, you know, putting that mesh up now. To, so. <laughs> so look, to summarise, We've come a long way with self-assessment. It's certainly, from a client viewpoint, from a certainty viewpoint, we're nowhere near where we used to be in pre-1986. There's more balance in the process, but with that there's a whole lot more complexity. And as much as we've got now certainty, that certainty comes in volumes and volumes of information, which most of us don't have time to look at, let alone understand whether there's a ruling or a subsection of a ruling that may apply. What is of concern is that the tax office uses, well, internally in the office they don't use law, they're instructed to follow a ruling. If there's no precedent there, so there's no atoid, there's no ruling, that's the only time they're meant to refer it up. And, that, and you do get the problem of the auditor sitting in the Adelaide office looking at your client here and saying, you know, you're charging too little, your cost of goods are too high and we're going to drag someone out, we're going to put your client through a record keeping audit. Do you have a lunch room? Someone asked one of my mates for this particular client. The client has a little booth shop and they said, can we sit, sit in there and observe? And he said, look, there's nowhere to sit. <laughs> there's a little counter. <laughs> what do you mean you don't have a tea room? I think we're, and look, we've heard some of the issues and, and people nodded when I said certain things. Some people have got the ability and the, and the client base that they're able to work through these and preempt. Others are acting in a reactionary right way because they're not, they don't have the client base or the data or the staffing and resources to, to do that level of service. It does create a problem if we to take any message forward to the tax office. It would be about giving opportunities where you invest time in ensuring that your client complies with all of this stuff and, they're e and you know that they're going to fall into an audit situation, that you can preempt it and avoid all the angst at a later date. I'll leave it there. Thank you.